degree from the University of Houston. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Sarah Davis. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Welcome. We'll get to the governor stuff in a second. As you know, I can't wait. <laughs> but I actually driving in today uh, with the radio on, thought to myself, I actually want to ask you about guns first. Sure. You're one of the couple hundred people who runs this state, and therefore you have your hand on the wheel. And so we look to you to tell us how we should think about these issues, or at least we look to you to make a decision about how these issues should be resolved. You have voted pretty consistently um, on the pro-gun or the pro-Second Amendment rights side of this conversation. I looked up your rating when I got in the office this morning from the NRA Political Victory Fund. It's a B plus. They haven't endorsed you in your race, but it's a, it's a, you know, it's a B plus. B plus is solid grade. You voted for open carry. You voted for campus carry, although you were one of the architects of some exe exceptions on the campus carry side. That may be why you don't have an A. I don't know. But in any case, you're generally on the pro-Second Amendment rights side of this. Is there a different conversation, Chairman Davis, that we need to be having about guns? This is, I don't know if it's the 12th or the 18th, there was some disagreement yesterday about the number of school shootings just in this calendar year. And that high school could have been in Texas, it could have been in Houston, it could have been in your district. Is there a different conversation we should be having about guns? Uh, I think that there is a different conversation that needs to be had. Um, I, you know, woke up this morning and was, you know, watching the news, and it's all about um, that horrible shooting. And of course, we just had some uh, shooting, uh, mass shooting in Texas. Right. Um, and I think it's a conversation, quite honestly, about the state of mental health in in, in Texas and across the nation. Over the last uh, couple sessions, of course, the speaker has prioritized uh, mental health uh, policy and mental health funding. But um, I, I think that we, we really have to come to grips with the fact that we have some um, very disturbed people that we need to be able to identify um, before they yep. show up and start shooting. Is that the people. limits to the conversation? I don't want to go on too long on this, but is that the limit to, to this conversation? Just talk about mental health. You know, you know I, you're somebody who has no problem pissing off other Republicans, so I figure I'll give you the opportunity to do so here. Is there no conversation we should be having about, you know, does this kid need an automatic weapon? Or does this kid need high capacity magazines? I mean, without limiting the rights of people to own or to use in a recreational sense guns, should we be limiting some other aspects of this to hold off situations like this that have happened repeatedly and could, for all we know, happen repeatedly going forward? Well, based on what I've learned uh, from the news, this uh, kid should not have been given um, a high-capacity automatic uh, weapon because right. he clearly was suffering from uh, some mental disorders. But I do think you could have a conversation about our background check system. We've seen in Texas that it was that, that the Texas back the Texas wasn't communicating right. efficiently with the feds, and I believe that when we were, I you know when Congress was uh, formulating these background checks, this was this was long before social media, um, and long before a general, a more acceptance or a less less stigmatized environment regarding mental health. So I think that there are some places, I, and I would like to see the federal government look at what all are we, are we requiring in the back. With regard to, so that's the conversation you'd have. Back, I believe back, back so. Sorry. So let's move to the current political situation that you're in. I, I, I'm going to rely on the kind of cliche interview trick of role playing. Let's role play. You're you, I'm Governor Abbott. Is there anything you want to say to me? <laughs> I look forward to working with you next session. You do? <laughs> now, now, let me be Governor Abbott, but you're not going to be back. Um, what did you do to the governor? What happened to you guys? Can you explain it? Well, m not really. I mean, I cannot, um, I cannot explain the governor's motivations. Has he, has he talked to you? Did he call you and say, heads up, I'm dropping a bomb on you or something? Has, oh. Did he give you any heads up about this? Oh, no, of course not. No. no. Well, I don't, I don't assume, of course not. He seems like a nice enough guy. He doesn't talk to me either, so I don't actually know. But, um, <laughs> but, but, I, but I assume that the governor might, or somebody in the governor's orbit might just say, heads up, we're, we're fixing to turn both barrels on you here. We're fixing to, to drop a couple hundred thousand dollars in ads on you. I, it seems like the courteous thing to do. No. Uh, it, you know, what, it could be courteous, I don't know, but no, there was no um, heads up. The only indication we had 
that we could possibly anticipate the governor's involvement was uh, the comments that he made during the special session that you know he was keeping a list of of the legislators that didn't support his naughty list and a nice list. That's right. That's right. right. And um, you know, I had no doubt that I was going to be on that naughty list. Um, but you were also, uh, Chairman, you're also not going to be alone on that list because if you go back and look at who supported the governor's 20 priorities in the special, the reality is there are an awful lot of people who the governor has not come out against. That's that is correct. So, um, so I'm just thinking that there must be something about you. Um, well, I think that I'm a pretty nice, thoughtful person. Um, obviously, during the special session, uh, I had a press conference as chair of the General Investigating and Ethics Committee uh, requesting that the governor add ethics to the special session call. Right. Um, he had made ethics emergency items the prior two sessions. Two sessions. And ethics reform is something very difficult to pass in a regular session. Everyone likes to campaign and say they want ethics reform. Right. But it's very easy to kill ethics reform. And it's, I think it would be, it's easier in a special session. Um, and so you think he might have been offended by the fact that you stepped up and, and called him out for not putting it on the call? Well, I would first say that I was very respectful in my comments right. um, at the press conference. I was uh, not critical <laughs> at all. It was yeah. a very straightforward and I believe very respectful press conference. Obviously, um, you know, my dear friend and colleague Lyle Larson was a little bit more aggressive um, in right. his demeanor. But, you know, looking back at that press conference, I, you know, I was the only woman there. I'm surrounded, um, of course, from my all-male committee of general investigating and ethics. So, I mean, in fairness, there are no women in the legislature, so that's okay. You know. Well, you know, there are some of us. Um, it, interesting, in 2010, or I guess 11, when I entered into the session, uh, there were 18 Republican women in, in the House. And right now there are eight, and we know that that number is going to drop. Yeah. So, um, so you think there's something about the fact that you're a woman, that's why the governor's coming after you? I mean, just come out and say it if that's what you think. I, I'm not really sure. I don't, I, I don't know if it's about being a woman or if it's about being a woman that um, you know, he can't control. But, well, so, but, so, but if you yeah. look at who he's come out against, Lyle Larson re very recently. Not a woman. Not a woman. Um, and Wayne Faircloth, also pretty not recently, and there's been no, to my knowledge, the governor has not spent any money. No, no, no. The spend against you and the visibility of the assault against you has been significantly greater than that against Larson. I believe the governor may have been in a radio ad against Larson, but I don't, but I mean, there's not a comparison. Well, I mean, and that's the, and, and to the point of why the governor, I ask you, why is the governor coming after you? The reality is you and I both know why the governor is coming after you, because there's a, a work product that we can turn to and analyze because he said explicitly in the ads now as of last night four that he has put up on behalf of Ms. Dokapil who is the opponent uh, your opponent in the primary we know exactly what the bill of particulars is I thought we would talk about that and I sure. want to give you an opportunity to talk about the things that the governor says are wrong with you or wrong with your candidacy and let's begin with abortion so yesterday at 525 or so the governor's camp pre came previewed an ad that is going to go up that put you and Wendy Davis together, basically turning you into a Wendy Davis. I probably couldn't find an Angela Davis picture, so they just went ahead with Wendy Davis. Um, and uh, it's an ad that features you and Wendy Davis, and it, it basically says that you and Wendy Davis are alike on a whole host of issues. But of course, the issue that they're talking about is one they've talked about in ads previously, and that's abortion, that you and Wendy Davis are aligned. The governor has said now repeatedly in that ad, but not just in that ad, that you are for late-term abortions. Is that true? Um, no, it is not true. And, and I, I think we first have to look at the origins of these ads. There's four now. The first ad, I believe, was all a very positive message about my opponent. And um, obviously that wasn't sticking. So then they moved to a second ad that was, you know, 15 seconds anti-Sarah, 15 seconds pro my opponent. And then the third ad and the fourth ad are 100% right. against me, not even the mention of uh, my opponent. And so, you know, normally... Well, they're trying to beat you. And they're not trying to elect her, they're trying to beat you. They're trying to beat me, and it's clearly not working. That's why these ads are getting progressively negative. Well, we'll see about that. But again, back to the abortion thing. Sure. Are you or are you not for late-term abortions? I am not for late-term abortions. In 2013, when we had the big omnibus abortion bill... HB2. HB2. That bill had several components, the first of which was the ban 
uh, the 20 week ban. And 20 weeks is five months. Banning abortion at five months. Then there were other components like requiring um, abortion facilities to meet ambulatory surgical center requirements. I think uh, one of the requirements was for admitting privileges. Yes. And then the third requirement had to do um, with basically requiring the state to ignore any FDA updates on the, um, on the abortion pill because the FDA was getting ready to um, decrease you know, the, the amount of, of medicine you know, that had to be ingested. Um, and so this was saying, yeah, you have to ignore all future right. FDA. So I thought this is all basically creating a de facto ban on abortion. And so I had an amendment um, and we were, I was on the floor for probably an hour with this amendment, um, arguing in support of the ban on abortion at 20 weeks, with exceptions that include rape, incest, and life and health of the mother, and then um, getting rid of the other, the other part of the bill, because right. I thought that if we got rid of that, that we would have a better uh, footing before the courts, because we knew we were going to get sued. And lo and behold, uh, lawsuits were filed, and the U.S. Supreme Court did exactly what I predicted on the floor right. of the House. And so as a result, we don't have a, you right. know, as effective of, as a pro-life legislation. And, um, but, when they say, but when they say in the ad, Sarah Davis was the only Republican to vote against this bill, that is true. That is true. But the reason is what you just said. The reason is because I believed it to be unconstitutional. Right. It's a waste of our, ta our taxpayer dollars to have to defend bills that we consistently pass that right. we know are unconstitutional. But I argued, and right. I mean, it's archived but, video. But you're, but you're for, so you, you would say, I am for a ban on abortions after five, week, five months. With exceptions. With, with exceptions. Yes. So when they say you're for late-term abortions, you say, in fact, I'm not. Correct. Except your voting record in the journal, without the benefit of explanation, I hear Karl Rove's words in my ears when you're explaining you're losing. Right. The benefit, the benefit uh, uh, that we enjoy today of your explanation in real time does not convey in the journal when all anybody sees is you voted against this bill. Well, I believe that my, my I know that my amendment and the, te and the argument on the floor are also, in, are also, are in, also the in the journal. So, but, but yeah. I mean, that's the problem. I mean, we are operating in this time where <laughs> Apparently, we are not allowed to be thoughtful or have nuanced positions that we are either one extreme or the other. Yeah. And that is not who I am. That is not uh, the type of policymaker or candidate that I've ever led anyone to believe that I am. Right. And it is not the kind of um, legislator that the folks that live in House District 134 would elect. Well, I want to come to the district in a second and the degree to which on this issue and others you are voting with or without, with your district or not. I, I was trying to remember what your position, stated position was on the issue of abortion. And I seem to remember from some years ago that you had said you were pro-life. I went back and tried to find anything in writing about that and, or try to find you saying that on video. And in fact, I was hard pressed to find that. Am I wrong to think that at one point you described yourself as pro-life? Uh, and I think that what I said was, well, of course I'm pro-life, I'm not pro-death. But as far as the issue goes, and you understand what pro-life means in the context of this conversation. Yes, I do. I was not able to find a stated position as such. And then I watched from home our Tribcast yesterday, and you said the following. With regard to the governor's attacks on you on abortion, I, I, my head kind of snapped when I heard this, and I went back and watched it a second time. If you want to attack me for being pro-choice, do it. I am. Those were your words yesterday, point blank. Yes. So the jig's up. You're pro-choice. The jig is... Has there's the jig never been, been a jig. Well, well but, but, you, I know, mean, but, but what, you know, I've not no. heard you say those words before. Well, but, but there's never been a jig. When I was first elected in 2010 and going into the legislature in 2011, the first major vote that I had to take was on the sonogram bill. And you were opposed. And I was opposed. Right. And I was the only Republican then that voted against the sonogram right. bill. So I... I but as a, not, but, this but, is but, not but a secret. But you're smart politically enough to know that it is one thing to vote a certain way but not attach or allow the, the label to be attached to you. 
It's another thing to just come out and say it. Th this is not a judgment, of course. It's not said pejoratively, but it's clarifying. And I actually found your statement yesterday to be quite clarifying at a time when people are, are wondering, well, where is she? How do we, where do we put her? I mean, it's all about labels, I understand. It, and that's the problem, yeah. because yeah. the label pro-life means no exceptions, no abortion, never. And then you have pro-choice, and some people perceive that is abortion on demand, paid for by the government at right. any point prior to birth. And I am, I am not right. in either of those camps. This is the nuance that you referred Correct. to. Correct. Oh, right. And with regard to your district, I, I, uh, I went back and watched an interview that you did with Rachel Maddow in 2015. And you said this, we're all elected by a constituency. My colleagues are making votes and making policy decisions based on the people who elect them. I make policy decisions and take the votes that I take based on the folks who elect me. At the end of the day, we answer to the people who come out to vote. You, st you still believe that? 100%. And so you, are, you believe that your votes in the legislature represent the people who you represent in your district? Absolutely. Just as um, maybe as frustrating as it can be that, you know, to watch Jonathan Sicklin vote, he represents the people that elect him. Right. And you don't begrudge him that? No, I and do not. And he should not begrudge you your right to vote for the people who represent you. And of course he does, but... Right. Um, I, I have seen some polling by independent parties, uh, or I should say interested parties, not associated with your campaign in your district um, on this issue. And the polling that I have seen suggests that only 50% of Republican voters identify as pro-life in your district, of Republican voters. 42% identify as pro-choice. I mean, th your district is kind of split on this issue at b within your primary at best. Correct. Right? And in fact, if you go back and look at the last couple of elections, um, Wendy Davis ran 10 points ahead of her statewide total in your district in the in 2014 race. Hillary Clinton ran more than 11 points ahead and won your district in the last election. Maybe actually the governor putting you and Wendy Davis in an ad together is helpful to you. <laughs> Have well, you considered that? You should send him a thank you note. It's like an in-kind contribution <laughs> no, to your campaign. No, but I am grateful that they are using um, flattering pictures of me in the commercials <laughs> as opposed to the, you know, grainy, black and white, you know, kind of manipulated. Right. Who, who'd you vote for for president, by the way, since we're talking about Hillary and Trump in your district? Do you want to tell us? No. No? You understand that by not telling us, you're telling us, right? I don't think so. Okay. All right. Um, let me ask you about state spending. Another, so there have been, there are, basically there are four principal lines of attack in these ads as you lay them out end to end. Abortion is one, we've already dealt with that. State spending is another. So there was a Tan Parker, I think Tan Parker was the lead actor on this, he was not the only person in the water on this, but it was a bill that Tan Parker was, uh, carried in the special. A constitutional limit on the rate of growth of appropriations. This was a limit on state spending. The governor's ads, again, multiple ads say, Sarah Davis opposed a limit on state spending. That's what was said. So I went back and looked at exactly at what happened here. So the Tan Parker bill started in appropriations. You're a member of appropriations. There was a voice vote on that bill. It was not a record vote. Did you vote for that bill in appropriations? I believe I did, yes. Okay, I mean, we don't know, so I'm going to have to take your word. I mean, I know I didn't vote no, but all I could say is that that was a point where we were, I was in conference committee, so I... Right. I don't have a specific recollection if I was in that hearing, right. but I know I did not vote no. So the bill goes from appropriations that a committee you serve on to calendars. Another committee you serve on. You voted for the bill in calendars to go to the floor. I did. Okay. So I actually think that I am, I've probably voted for that bill more than any other member well, in well, the Texas well, and, House. And, and I want to I come to that question of whether you voted for the bill or against the bill in a second, because the reality is the bill was never voted on. That's correct. What happened was the bill comes up on the floor after it's in appropriations and we believe you voted for it in appropriations and it goes to calendars and you vote for it in calendars. It goes to the floor. Chris Turner, the Democratic caucus chair, calls a point of order on the bill. That's correct. The speaker upholds the point of order. Bill's dead. Aha. Matt Rinaldi from Irving collects enough signatures to challenge the ruling from the chair. Correct. I went back and reconstructed all this yesterday. And then there's a vote on, me. I would have told you. But, I, but if I call you, then you're telling me your story. I wanted to actually hear the independent story. So I called Turner, I called all the other, I called other people involved with this. So, there's a rule, so the ruling from the chair is challenged as a consequence of Rinaldi getting enough signatures to challenge the ruling of the chair. 
you vote to uphold the ruling of the speaker along with 33 other Republicans. 30, 34 Republicans in total vote to uphold the ruling of the chair. And the ruling of the chair is upheld. Yes. So the bill is, in fact, never voted on. Correct. That is, in the eyes of the governor, you voting against the limit on state spending. That is correct. And we've... I'm trying to figure out how that's voting against the limit on state spending. Um, we don't know. We've tried to explain... I'll bust your chops on other stuff, but I'm not sure on this that I can understand exactly where this is going. I, I don't either, but that's sort of been the way that the campaign against me has been going. It's really not based on right. facts at so all. So you are for a limit on state spending? Yes, we've, we, have, we have limits on state spending, and I'm, would, I'm never going to vote against a limit on state spending. So had the Tan Parker bill come up, you would have voted for it? Yes. Period. Yes, and I did vote for it. Right, you voted for it in calendars. Right. But th that, that's the point on that. Okay. Yeah. But that's, I mean, that's just the pattern that we're seeing. It's, it's accusations that are not true, a manipulation of a voting <laughs> record. You know, the governor comes down to my district and has a fundraiser for my opponent and says that I tried to take uh, money out of his disaster relief oh, 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 We're, we're going to come to that in a second. Okay. We'll come to that in a second. So I want to I come back to the ethics thing. So the, the governor has said, again, at various points in these ads, Sarah Davis is not for ethics reform, not for ethics legislation. I seem to remember that the person who carried ethics legislation two sessions ago was Sarah Davis, correct? I want to go forward and come back to how that resolved itself at the end of that session uh, in a second. So the accusation specifically in this instance is that you bottled up legislation for personal reasons. Um, uh, they said, you know, uh, out of spite. That was the phrase they used, out of spite. And I went back and, in fact, looked it up. And what happened was there was legislation revolving the revolving door and involving the revolving door policy that you acknowledged to the Houston Chronicle on August the 3rd during the special that you had held up because the Senate had held up some of your stuff. That's correct. Is that defensible? People send you to, to Austin from your district to fight with the Senate and not get stuff done? Um, well, I think there's always this natural tension between the two chambers. And what we saw this session was that the Senate was really holding up almost all of House leadership's bills. Um, and I think they didn't even refer about 80% of my bills. Yeah, but we, so, don't, we don't send you there to fight. This is not like high school. We don't send you guys to fight with the other chamber. This is, by the way, a problem in both cases. We send I, you there to get stuff done. Yes, and what I was trying to get done was uh, property reappraisal for victims of natural disasters. So, then, but, so when the governor says Sarah Davis bottled up ethics legislation out of spite, True. Well, no, I didn't bottle it up. I was holding it. Um, my office was in communications with the lieutenant governor's office, and we were advised that if we passed out of my committee the ethics, the revolving door bill, then the lieutenant governor would refer my disaster reappraisal bill. So I immediately passed the revolving uh, door bill out of GIE, and then the lieutenant governor said to my office, or not him, you know, someone in his office told my staff that they didn't mean they would refer it if I passed it out of committee. They meant they would refer it once it got out of calendars. Well, at that point in session, I mean, it was just, it was, a, it was above my pay grade. I mean, the tensions right. are between the, the speaker and the lieutenant governor. And despite right. what, you know, may, people may think, I am not the speaker. I am not the chair of calendars. You know, I'm one member. You only member. have so much power. I only have so much power. Right. And so that bill was a part of a bigger, I think, discussion right. uh, and than, than I was involved in. Right. And when it became obvious, of course, that, that they weren't going to let that revolving uh, bill door out, um, I immediately right. tried to get the Senate version of my reappraisal uh, bill. Now, I hear your explanation. And again, we in the room have the benefit of hearing your explanation. But again, this is the second issue on which the governor, in his simplification of an issue against you, is not wrong factually. It's just that there's more to the story. There's more to the story. And it, you have to also realize, I mean, I passed out you know, all of, all of the ethics from our yeah. committee. And I think the real significant um, revolving door bill, the one that we actually voted on and, and, and got passed, was the one that prohibits legislators from using their campaign accounts as, uh, to lobby for a year right. or two. 
Um, so you'll defend your record on ethics legislation? Yeah, I absolutely will defend my record. Yeah. And, 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 and to be honest with you, when um, I uh, made it clear that we were going to add the executive to that revolving door uh, bill, it got uh, a little bit less um, uh, reception. Well, let's, let's talk about that. So you mentioned Larson. Larson has definitely been, you know, with regard to going after the governor's office on stuff, you know, it's like Sarah Davis, I'm going to go after the governor, Lyle Larson, hold my beer. That's basically what's been going on here. Right? <laughs> um, L L Larson has been more and more on this than you have. And Larson specifically has been the one carrying the legislation that would restrict severely the ability of the governor to appoint anybody to a border commission above a certain, I think $2,500 was the amount that the Larson bill has I believe so, yeah. And, and the governor's hostility to Larson in this instance, this primary cycle may specifically be about that. I mean, he'd say it's about other things, but it may specifically be about that. Is Larson right? Should the governor, as far as it goes, be restricted from appointing anybody who gives more than $2,500? Yes or no? I think that's a good bill. So you support that? Yes, idea. I do. Is that realistic? And is it necessary? Anybody who wants to write a check is automatically disqualified. Aren't there qualified people who also write checks? Aren't there unqualified people who don't write checks? But it seems Hasn't it been ever thus? But it seems that there is a pattern um, of you know, being able to write checks and get some pretty good appointments. And, but you assume that the, but you're, you must specifically be referring to the people who are bad appointees as opposed to good ones because you wouldn't be complaining about good appointees. Well, or is it just a bad that, look? I just, think it's, I just think it doesn't pass the smell test. Right. I haven't done any kind of analysis to who right. are good appointees versus who are bad. So you don't do any favors for your donors? No. Ever? If I look back and said, who are Sarah Davis's largest donors and what are their interests, and I tried to make an association between A and B, I would not find any association? Um, well, my largest contributor right now is the association of the ART, Associated Republicans of Texas, and right. you know their uh, purpose and goal is to elect common sense Republicans. I guess what I'm saying is, do you automatically assume that becoming a donor to a politician corrupts that relationship to the point that they can no longer do stuff together again. No, I don't. I don't. But there is a difference when you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in donations or, you know, millions of dollars in donations. But I don't necessarily believe that just because someone gives a politician a donation that that automatically means there's corruption. Uh, let, me really ask, yeah, let me ask the question straight away and then we'll move on. Do you believe Greg Abbott is ethical? Uh, yes, I do. I don't believe that. I have no reason to believe that he has done anything unethical whatsoever. So this is not about him. This is about it. Yes. I, I will say, though, that pushing or blaming me for the failure of this revolving door bill is somewhat hypocritical when, you know, he uh, hires directly from the lobby to replace his staff who leave to go directly to the lobby. And so if, you know, stopping the revolving door was really such a priority, he could certainly lead by example. But he's ethical. Yes, I, I, have, I have absolutely you're no not, you're not You're not going back on what you just said? I, no, no, no. So nothing, not, there's nothing unethical about hiring a lobbyist? No, no. Okay, just, I just want to clarify where you stand on that. So let, let's... It's not unethical, but when you're saying as the governor, it shouldn't be done and you're doing it, I just think it seems a little bit disingenuous um, when you're attacked. That's Louis signs on the phone right there, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, let's, uh, let, me, uh, let me go on to Harvey, and in the course of going on to Harvey, I want to come back to, by the way, this is the only room in America where a Louis signs joke gets laughs. <laughs> um, I, want, I want to go back, I want to go to Harvey, but then in the course of Harvey, I want to come back to ethics in a second. So let's talk about what happened on Harvey. You were one of a number of legislators in both parties who came into the special session full of beans to restore the Medicaid therapy cuts. This was a bipartisan issue. There seemed to be general agreement on, you know, we probably did something we shouldn't have done and the impact of it was something that we either hadn't considered or it was greater than we thought. We're going to run. And you were a lead, a, a lead actor in, on, on this effort. It was my bill. It was your I bill. You were the lead bill. actor. But there were, my point is that there were others standing shoulder to shoulder with you. You were not out on an island on this. I, was, I had members of the Freedom Caucus actually joint right. author that bill, right. Republicans and Democrats. Well, in fact, Matt Krause told me yesterday he was a joint author of the bill. That's correct. Right. Okay, and it passed off the floor unanimously. Unanimously. But, and we'll come to that in a second. So what happens in the course of this bill? So this bill says we're going to restore the Medicaid therapy cuts, and the mechanism for doing it was the rainy day fund. Yes. Okay. So at a certain point, as I understand the story, Krauss introduces an amendment 
And the amendment basically says, look, the Senate is not going to approve this bill if the source of the funds is the rainy day fund. They're just not going to go for it. So we need to figure out some other mechanism to fund this. So he suggests that the funds instead come out of the disaster relief bucket. And my recollection of this, Chairman, is that you spoke, first thing you did was you spoke against that idea because you said, look, and this is pre-Harvey. Correct. You said, look, I represent a part of the state that is prone to have issues that may require presciently, may require money out of the disaster relief bucket. So I'm not good with this. You spoke out against it, amendment comes up, and you vote against the amendment. Correct. But the amendment passes. Correct. Okay. Bill comes up on the floor, and the bill passes 139 to nothing. And you're one of the yes votes on the bill. But you didn't like the Krauss amendment. Absolutely not. I spoke against it. I right. voted against it. But you ultimately voted for the bill that contained the thing that you didn't like. Correct. Because you believe that the bill was important enough even if flawed. I believe that the bill was important enough even if flawed. I also believed it was important to have a unanimous vote right. um, to send the signal to the governor that this is a really important issue. Right. And I knew that whether or not, I knew that once we sent it to the Senate, that the Senate would most likely not agree to take money out of the governor's disaster relief fund, and at that point we could get a conference committee. Do you agree with Krauss's amendment, the principle or the premise of Krauss's amendment that the Senate was never going to take this out of the rainy day fund, so we had to come up with a different mechanism? Or were you just, we do us, they do them, whatever we send them, let them decide what they want to do, we should just do it the way that I want to do it? No, I don't know that I necessarily agree with that. Yeah. Um, I mean, so it was for $70 million, which is not, you know, in the face of an $11 billion rainy day fund, it's a small it's fraction. A small amount of money. So I think that um, we had a fighting chance for that. But I was right. hoping, um, you know, that at the end of the day we would get to a conference committee. But I think it's important to remember why we got there in the begin with. Why did we have to ask, uh, why did I have to file a bill to reinstate those um, cuts that were made, the $70 million. Well, we had to do that because the legislature was given a very flawed report from where? The Health and Human Services Commission, an executive agency that Abbott is in charge of and is supposed to be governing. So you blame the governor? Well, I think that he needs to do a better job uh, on being on top of his agencies. And if, and it, I mean, just look at what happened this session with the TABC. I'm familiar with that. Yeah. Yeah, well, but, but let, me, let me stay stay on the Harvey stuff. Sure. Stay on the Harvey stuff. So you voted for the bill that contained the provision that took money out of the disaster relief budget. So when the governor puts on an ad and says, Sarah Davis voted to take money out of the disaster relief budget, that is true. Correct. But. Again, Karl Rove's words in my ear. <laughs> You're explaining. Yeah. I mean, and look. Couldn't you have withdrawn, if you didn't like that provision, couldn't you have just withdrawn the bill? Um, you know, that would have been an option, but I really just felt it was far too important to do whatever we could to reverse these right. cuts. Because, Representative Chairman, I, I actually thought about, hasn't there been an instance in the past where Chairman Davis carried a bill where there was what she considered to be a crappy amendment attached to it, where she didn't go forward with it? And then I thought, ethics. I thought... Chairman Davis, two sessions ago, carried ethics legislation that went over to the Senate and came back with a so-called spousal exemption authored by Senator Huffman. And the bill passed, and sine die happens, and you realize, wait a minute, it's got this, this flaming bag of poo in it, and it's getting ready to go to the governor's office, and you advocated to the governor that he veto your bill because of that. And he did. Correct. So. Couldn't you have done run a similar play on this bill if you didn't like the disaster relief money coming out of the budget? You could have done this. You could have pulled your bill. You could have done whatever you. I mean, you've done this in the past. Well, no. Well, there's only one option. There is to pull the bill. So pull is, the bill down. Right. I mean, the bill didn't pass, and then I, the governor signed it, and then I. No, I get you know, it. But the, vetoes, I guess the point so. is, if you didn't, you know, you, 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 do you acknowledge that you make yourself susceptible to this attack by, by voting for the bill that contained the thing that you didn't want? Sure. I mean, sure. it's a little bit like, you know, I've, I've interviewed a couple people who voted against the Schaefer Amendment on sanctuary cities, and they go, oh, you know, I really didn't like the Schaefer Amendment. 
yeah, but you voted for the bill. Well, yes, because even though it was flawed, I voted for it. Well, then you really can't sit here and poor mouth me on the Schaefer Amendment because you voted for it. I mean, it's the same kind of thing. It's like you, bought, you voted for the bill. So then the governor gets to attack you on voting for the bill. That's, that's accurate. And I will say that... Because some people have stepped up and said, well, you know, that's a lie. That's not right when they say that she took money out of the disaster relief budget. In fact, it's not a lie. But it's not the whole truth, I don't believe. Well, it's not the whole story. It's not the whole story. And, um, and, and I had contemplated pulling that bill down. But there was so much support on the floor. Yeah to move forward in any way possible. Right. I mean, uh, yeah. we're talking about severely disabled children. These are children that can't swallow. These are children that have convulsions that cause, that they break bones. I mean, this is an extremely vulnerable population. And I felt like we had sincerely made a mistake right. well, in uh, that, yeah. but in, with those cuts. And I had never seen so much support from the body for this particular issue. Well, and that's the point, 139 to nothing. What that means, let's just talk about what that means. There are a number of people who voted to do exactly what the governor criticizes you for doing, who the governor has endorsed in this primary. The governor's endorsed Krauss, for instance. Correct. <laughs> Krauss authored the damn amendment, and the governor's endorsed Krauss. So in some ways, I mean, you need to explain more to get people to understand but at the same time, the governor is criticizing you in an ad, in multiple ads, for doing something that people he's endorsed also did. And, and I will say, following during or the day of that debate, the first on second reading, when I got off the floor, there was a member of the governor's staff waiting outside my office to, to relay thanks for uh, defending the governor's disaster relief fund. Well, that was then. That was then. This um, is now. So a couple more things here. Um, in these ads, the governor uses a couple of phrases repeatedly to describe you. A liberal you can't trust, that was one. Sarah Davis, quote, sold out conservative values, that's another one. Let me just put the question to you this way. Why are you a Republican? There are a lot of people who look at your record. And do you think moderate, by the way, is a four-letter word? Is that a pejorative? Uh, not in my area, no. Because you're described as a moderate Republican. Obviously, the governor goes further and says you're a liberal, you can't be trusted, all this kind of stuff. I just wonder, why are you a Republican? Have you ever thought about not being a Republican? What about the Republican Party today do you see aligned with your value set? And how do you defend against this? Well, no, I have not thought about not being a Republican. And I am a Republican for very basic and fundamental reasons and traditional reasons, because I believe in personal freedom, individual responsibility, and limited government. And what's going on in the Texas Republican Party um, is pretty shocking to me. I was very disappointed when they chose to censure the speaker. Um, it, is, it, is, it is becoming you know, difficult to really understand the direction of where our party is going in this state. You believe you're more of a Republican than the people who are in your party? You know, I'm not, I don't want to, uh, well, but you're identifying. I, I believe, I believe yeah. that I am a, I'm a very traditional Republican. I think that um, if, if, if our party cannot handle a diversity of voices and cannot be big enough for a Republican like me, then what message are we sending to Republican women from all over the state, which is almost like you're not welcome in this Is it only about women? No, I don't think it is about women, but I can tell you I have such strong support from Republican women from all over the state. And when the, my own Harris County Republican Party actually attempted to censure me, it was Republican women from all over Harris County that showed up en masse um, to the executive committee just to stare, you know, with yeah. disgust. And uh, right. you know, the censure motion was withdrawn. Um, but I, I, I'm not going to leave just right. because... Um, you know, someone disagrees with me because I think I have a very important voice yeah. in the Republican Party. And, um, you know, I, I think I'm necessary. I think that there are so many Republicans that are just like me. And I know that because everywhere I go in my district, people come up to me and tell me that. Yeah. Are, is everything with you and the governor recoverable? I, I, I would hope so. Will you vote for him? <laughs> yes or no, Representative? <clears throat> It'll be hard to do that. So you're not committing to voting for the governor? No, I can't do that. I cannot commit. 
Will you work with the governor in next session? Absolutely. If you need to? Absolutely. There are far more issues that the governor and I are going to agree on than disagree on. Would you consider vote? Let me go back. Will you consider voting for a Democrat, or would you just not vote? I would most likely just not if vote. If you didn't vote for the governor, it would just be you'd pass that, you'd bypass that one. As a candidate, there's actually nothing more annoying than what's called the undervote, which is when someone shows up to vote, but they skip, they don't vote in your race. You just want to go, why couldn't you have just, you So know. the bumper sticker on your car will be, annoy the governor undervote. That will be, <laughs> that, that will be it. Um, qu quickly, with regard to next session, before we go to questions, um, do we need to do more on immigration than we did in the last session? Do you feel like we've dealt with the issue sufficiently, or is there going to be more work to be done in your mind on that issue? That's obviously a big topic of conversation heading into another session. I'm not entirely sure what more the state can do at this point. I mean, we have passed our sanctuary city bill. Which you supported. Which I was Although you were not in the room when the Schaefer happened because you were with the appropriations subcommittee chairs. Would you have voted for that Schaefer amendment? No. You would have been a no vote on that, but you were a yes vote on the bill. Yes. And unambivalently a yes vote on the bill. Yes. Yeah, okay. So you, you've passed that. You've got $800 million in and We've got $800 million in GR for border security. I don't know what more the state can do. I mean, the feds, this is honestly a federal issue. Well, one thing the state could do is do what the state said it would do if they got a president more to their liking in the White House, and that is stop spending $800 million on border security and offload that responsibility at a time of budget austerity back to the federal government. That's true, and prior to session uh, starting, there was a small meeting. A few members were invited um, to the governor's mansion, and when the question was posed to him, um, about continuing this $800 million for border security now that Trump has been elected and he's said he's uh, sending assets to the border and he's made immigration, you know, his number one priority. And the governor said that until he felt confident that, um, that Trump was going to follow through and that those assets were, were there, that we needed to keep that uh, funding stream in place. And you support that? Uh, $800 million is a lot of money. Um, I supported it in the budget, you know, both sessions, um, but I mean, at, at some point, you know, we are the only state that continues to pay for border security, a border state that's spending GR. Right. Of course, we do have the most contiguous miles with the border of any state, yes. so it is kind of our issue. It is, and, and it's important, but I think that if we do get the assets that we need from the feds, then we do need to scale back to cut, how much cut back. state money we're spending. Let me ask you about the bathroom legislation that took up so much of our time and attention during the, during the last legislative session. Uh, there certainly seems to be a drumbeat in some quarters for that bill to come back up since it didn't pass in this last session. I think the lieutenant governor is not likely to let that uh, just go uncommented upon or without thinking about bringing it back up. The governor showed his hand uh, during the latter part of the session in supporting the governor or some version, I mean, the lieutenant governor or some version of the bill that the lieutenant governor was for out of the Senate. With the departure of Speaker Strauss, it is almost a certainty that the next speaker will be more conservative because physics, right? I mean, you got, who's the potential speaker? Likely to be somebody more conservative than Joe Strauss. So if a more conservative speaker is the speaker and somebody who is more conservative as speaker permits that bill to come to the floor, it's a hard political vote. I mean, all along the discussion was, if the bill never gets to the floor, then it never gets to the floor. But if it gets to the floor, it's a hard vote for people to vote against. Republican. Not for me, but... You would be of no vote under any circumstance. Correct. In fact, you said yesterday to our podcast group, it's a non-starter for me, it's a complete waste of time. That was your exact phrase. Correct. Your position on that will not change. No. Right. You believe that bill would pass if it got to the floor of the next legislature? Yes. Anything that you feel you and those who don't support this bill like you feel can be done to hold that off? Um, it would probably, we would prob they would probably need to rely on the governor. Um, even though the governor publicly, you know, had made statements in support and obviously added the bathroom bill to the special session call. Yeah. The things that I were hearing was that, you know, the governor knew that the speaker would never let it get to the floor. Um, well, the way to call the governor's bluff on that would be for the bill actually to pass and to see if he signed it. He'd probably be in the same position as you all would be, which is it's a hard vote not to cast and it's a hard bill not to sign. Yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure he would sign it. Right. I mean, I don't know, but I think that he would. Right. On the subject of the speaker's race, show your hand. Who's your candidate? <laughs> we don't even know who else is running. Well, so it's like fan fiction. You get to put anybody in that box. <laughs> <laughs> Who is it? I, I, I don't know. 
No? No. You're We're, sorry Strauss has not come back? Very, very. Yeah. You fear for the House? No, no. I mean, we've, it, you know, we're, everyone's always saying, you know, the sky is falling. And, and the truth is that the chamber has a lot of really good, hardworking members. And Speaker Strauss's, Speaker Strauss will be a loss, but I, I'm yeah. confident You that like Zerwas? I adore Dr. Zerwas. Dr. Zerwas were Speaker, you'd be good with that? Absolutely. I'm, I am served with him for many sessions as his Article II yeah. um, chair and when, and his budget conferee. I think Dr. Zerwas would be a great when, I'm going to go to questions here in a second. When Dr. Zerwas was here a couple of months ago talking about the Speaker's race, I said to him, based on the math of the House, you can either get elected with the votes of the Freedom Caucus or you can get elected with the votes of Democrats. Would you take the latter off the table? In other words, would you be willing to be elected with the votes of Democrats if that's what it took? And he, he kind of was like, he just sort of didn't answer. He, he didn't take off the table the idea that you do a coalition that has Democrats and some <coughs> Republicans. Do you think the next speaker should be elected by Democrats? I think the next speaker uh, should and will be elected out of the Republican caucus. You supported the Republican caucus's idea that they come out with one vote? Yes. And, and there's one candidate? Yeah. Even if it's somebody who you don't like? If yeah. you're, your buddy Stickland were happening, you know. And I, I don't believe that's going to happen. The God, the, the God that I worship does not love me enough to give me that outcome. Um, but but, uh, but if Stickland happened to be the speaker, it would be fine. You it would, would support, be very fun. You would vote for speaker for Stickland. If that, if if he, it's just like that's a crazy theoretical that will never happen. Think about the world we live in. That's just like Wednesday. Come on, man. I mean, that's. You know. <laughs> well, I'm going to support whoever, whoever comes, out of, comes okay. out of the Republican caucus. Questions from the audience in the remaining 10 minutes we've got. Please put your hand up. Needless to say, right here in the front, Agnes is racing to see you. <coughs> You've behaved yourself mostly. I will ask. I will let you ask a question. Okay. Um, Go ahead. So my name is Joanne Richards, and the question that I have uh, has to do with access to women's health in rural Texas. Mm -hmm. Would you like to assess what that is now? You fear and that how the, it, yeah. and how it could be improved? You fear that the one of the impact of legislation over the last couple of sessions is that access in a general sense might have been limited. Has that come to pass? Um, yeah, I think we're definitely seeing we're not all, I mean not just in rural Texas but all over Texas. Um, and that's because we've had a real problem with finding the providers. Um, once we kicked Planned Parenthood out um, of the network, and we've had some unfortunate stumbles. I think the um, contract with the Heidi Group, which is a known anti-abortion uh, group, to you know, give them uh, several million dollars of state funds to do outreach and try and recruit women. So we, we, know, we're, we know that fewer women are um, accessing um, the Healthy Texas Women's Program, but we do have a significant amount of funding, and that's, a, that's a, an issue that I care very much about, and I'm very protective over that money in the budget. Are you optimistic that in the next session more access would materialize in the form of policy or budgeting? I hope, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, I, I think it's not something that can happen you know, overnight because you've got to rebuild <coughs> that, that provider network. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the most um, you know, really significant uh, policy decisions made with regards to the women's health was the auto enroll component that we put in the budget so that once mom uh, rolls off Medicaid 60 days after she gives birth she's auto enrolled in healthy Texas women so that there's not a, a like a lapse in at least coverage for benefits now the problem of course is is making sure that there's that adequate provider network and I'm I mean we're you know we we take a couple steps forward and then you know, one step back, but it's something that um, there are a lot of legislators on both sides of the aisle that are committed um, to seeing. And so I just think it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a little bit more time. Okay. Chairman Jonathan. Jonathan, Chairman. <laughs> Representative Davis, Jonathan Sines. Um, it's been reported that Speaker Strauss has made a $50,000 no donation to your campaign. Um, we know he was recently censured by two-thirds of the Senate Republican Executive Committee across the state. Um, do you have an idea yet how you're going to use the $50,000 from Joe Strauss and what issue you're going to focus on in your campaign with that money? Did you, have you gotten that contribution? Yes, yes. Anything um, wrong with that? No. Getting money from the Speaker? I don't, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. I was very proud that the Speaker is so committed to my reelection. Um, not only did he give me a 
$50,000, he came down to the district and appeared at a fundraiser for me where we raised um, at that fundraiser, you know, in excess of $100,000 um, from, by the way, from people that live in my district, um, not from, you know, outside the district. And I don't partition money like Joe Strauss money will be spent on issue X or for mail piece X that, you know, that's not how it works. So, you know, we'll be using that money um, to pay for our TV, you know, maybe expand our uh, TV ads and to pay for the, uh, the mail pieces that we, you know, continue to put out. Um, but, you know, what we're really focusing on is nothing that we spoke about today, but, but that is who is my opponent and why is she qualified to represent District 134. And having been embraced by the uh, anti-vaccine movement, I think is very scary because the district that I represent is home to the world's largest medical complex and I represent close to 7,000 doctors. Is so, that the issue? Is that the issue with regard to Ms. Dokeville? The uh, th That is the objection that you have to her, I mean, beyond the fact that you want to get reelected. Is, yeah, is, the, is the problem with her that she's anti-vaccine? Is that the first that, thing on your list? That's just one. That's just one thing on my list. But that is something that I find to be very frightening yeah. as a public health hazard, especially when we've just had the measles outbreak in Ellis County, right. and we see more and more people dying of the flu. Right. I mean, this is a very serious issue. Speaker Stickland would say, uh, "What do you have against liberty? What do you have against giving parents the opportunity to opt out of vaccinating their kids?" Um, well, I'm all for liberty, but your liberty ends when, you know, punches me in the face or kills, you know, makes kids at school get sick. If parents want to opt out of vaccines, they have that right. That's the law in Texas. Unfortunately, we're seeing the non-medical exemptions skyrocket in Texas. But, um, you know, they can opt out. I, I don't know that I believe necessarily then that those kids should be in our public school system. But if they are in our public school system, I think that the parents of those schools should have the freedom and the liberty to know how many, of, how many children in that school are unvaccinated. Not the names of those kids, but what the number is so that parents can make decisions about right. where to send their, their kids. Because we have medically fragile children. We have children with cancer and autoimmune disease. They cannot be vaccinated. Yeah. And so they need everyone around them vaccinated. Uh, one more quick, quickly on, before we take questions on, on Ms. Dokepil. I've heard you say one of your concerns about the outcome of this primary is that you believe if you win the primary you win even in a wave slash sharknado election you win if she wins the primary you believe you're handing the district off to a democrat do you have any evidence of that or is that just a, a line in the political mailer um well having represented the area for the last eight years I think I have a pretty good sense of who the voters are in in my area and uh, they are not likely to support someone that is going to be viewed um, as anti-science um, nor are they going to be supportive of someone that they don't believe is actually going to fight for the interests of the district as opposed to being yeah. a lackey you know for the governor or the lieutenant governor. And again, this is the district that Hillary Clinton won by more than 15 points in the last election. That's correct. And so right. that would be my evidence right. that, you know, you had Hillary win by 15, I won by 10, you know, much further down the ballot. This is a educated group of voters. Um, they don't necessarily, they do not have this blind party um, uh, loyalty. And then a few days ago, in fact, I was reading in the Chronicle that Eric Holder, has created a redistricting committee that he's, um, and, and former President Barack Obama is fundraising, helping to fundraise this committee, and they've identified, I believe, 10 states in which they're going, their, their long-term goal is obviously 2020 for redistricting, so they have identified 10 states in which they're going to try and, they're going to pour money in to flip competitive house and state, state house and state senate seats, and Texas was identified as one of them, and my particular house district was the first house district mentioned. Yep. And so, um, I, I absolutely can see that, and just quite frankly, talking to, you know, Democrats, you know, local Democrat operatives, they're, they're, they fully know that it would, they, they could not beat me. I mean, they've tried, right. they've spent over a million, you know, in 2012. Right. So I'm not, I'm not attainable. Of course, the Abbott people say, well, if we have Sarah Davis back in the legislature where we have a Democrat, what's the difference? That's what they say. 
Well, I mean, if Abbott wants to take responsibility for losing the losing seats and jeopardizing the majority, and then you know jeopardizing the redistricting process in 2020, that'll you're, be you're, that, good, you're good with that. that that'll be for him to, to respond to. In the back. Anybody else? <laughs> this ought to be good. You're going to wish Jonathan Sines asked a second question. I have a feeling. <laughs> Go ahead, um, Representative Davis. I wanted to ask you a sort of Harris County related question that I think is going to be a bigger issue in throughout this year and into next session regardless of whether you or Susanna Dacapol is the nominee in District 134. On January 6th of this year, the University of Houston announced the hiring of Kendall Bryles to be their new offensive coordinator. Kendall Bryles, of course, was the Son. former offensive coordinator at Baylor, who famously was caught in a lawsuit asking a uh, recruit in a text message, do you like white women because we have lots of them at Baylor and we, they love football players? <laughs> Therefore, my question, A, do you believe that the University of Houston acted appropriately in the first place in hiring Kendall Bryles? B, have they been sufficiently forthcoming in telling how they vetted Kendall Bryles, specifically as it relates to that text message? And C, what should they do at this point moving forward? And you as a Baylor alum have a special place in this conversation. Yeah, um, I was very disappointed when I learned about that hire. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think that that, I personally do not think that that was the right decision for UH. I mean, I respect Chancellor Couture. Um, she's done an amazing job for UH. But, you know, as a, as a Baylor alum, um, as a woman, uh, I, I, I do not agree with that hire. In terms of how they vetted that, or made that hiring decision, I don't, I don't know. I was not, I have, I've been given no information um, from UH about that. So I'm not entirely sure. And I, I didn't know about the email. Well, one of two things mentioned. had to have happened, uh, uh, Chairman. Either they vetted him and they said, yeah, we're good with this, or they didn't vet him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm not sure which is better or worse, right? But I, 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 I'm, um, I'm saddened by that decision. I don't, I don't think that was the, a good decision. Okay. Um, thanks for subjecting yourself to this. <laughs> Uh, and come back if you win. Thank you. All right, Sarah Davis, give her a big hand. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jenny. I appreciate it.